before we get started on what we need to cover for tonight, I need to backtrack from last time. Uh, there was some, uh, there was confusion. I'm responsible for that confusion, but I want to clarify what I said, what the Bible says, and what's correct. Mm -hmm. I made the statement that at the wedding feast there was 120 to 180 gallons of wine. That is a true statement. Now, how does it? But I didn't explain it. You see, that was the problem. It's a mathematical problem because the each pot held between 20 and 30 gallons of liquid and there were six pots. So if you multiply six times what I said, you have 120 to 180 gallons of wine. So it was not wrong, but it was not explained well. And I apologize for that. So having gotten that straightened out, and most of you are going, I don't even remember him saying it. <laughs> but nonetheless, for those that do remember, uh, hopefully that clarifies the, the situation. All right, so now, having finished at the wedding feast, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 2 of John, uh, it says, after this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, and his brothers and his disciples, there they stayed for a few days. Um, when you go down to Capernaum from Cana, it looks like you're going the wrong direction if you look at it on the map. But in reality, you do go down because he's talking topographical, not directional. In other words, uh, Cana was higher in elevation in Capernaum, so therefore he goes down to Capernaum, and that's uh, a, a common <clears throat> thing that happens in, in all the Gospels in terms of up and down that you have to understand many times they're talking elevation as opposed to direction, north, south, east, and west. Um, Joseph is not mentioned. It could be that he was still alive and working or it could be that joseph is dead by this time i that we don't know there there's no mention of it only mary and the, and uh, the brothers now the brothers is an interesting concept because there are those who will teach you who teach that mary being virgin mary had no other children other than jesus which is contradicted very specifically here when it refers to brothers. So after Jesus was born, she did not remain a, uh, a virgin without children and without relations with, with Joseph. Um, Jesus is moving his headquarters. It'll be temporary, it won't be for forever, but he's moving it to Capernaum now. And so the events that... Um, start taking place, come from Capernaum out. Um, beginning in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Again, direction. He's in the northern part of Gal uh, uh, Palestine going south down to Jerusalem. But he's going up to Jerusalem because Jerusalem is higher than Capernaum. All right, so again, just that up and down thing that's kind of interest, interesting and can be confusing if you're not aware of how they, uh, the writers put this. In, in the <clears throat> temple courts, he found <coughs> men selling cattle, sheep, and dogs, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and rolled all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold dives, he said, get these out of here for uh, how dare you make, how dare you turn my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered this, that it, that it is written, zeal for your house 
will consume me. All right. This is this is the first cleansing of the temple. It's going to happen again. But this is the first time. Um, I think it's important that we we understand a concept. Because for many years, and I think it was misrepresented in some of the stories I heard as a child, when it talks about the temple and being in the temple, the temple included the whole area, not just the building itself. So when you were in the temple, when you were in the courtyard of the temple, or when you were in the Gentile courtyard where the Gentiles came that were proselytes in Judaism. I say that because contrary to the pictures you may see, more than, I, mean, I wasn't there, and there aren't any good photographs left, so I, I don't know specifically, but there probably was not any cattle in the temple building itself as some of the final graph stories would have you believe. In reality, they were probably outside the building itself, but in the courtyard, area which made it according to Jewish law and custom in the temple. If you were in the in the courtyard area, you were considered generally to be in the temple. So there probably were not animals roaming around the interior of the temple, uh, but were outside. Um, there was a great deal of <clears throat> corruption going on here the law required <clears throat> that uh, you bring a perfect lamb passover for sacrifice or you procured a perfect lamb history tells us bible the bible does not but history tells us that it was not unusual for the Pharisees and Sadducees, well, Pharisees and scribes primarily, to be sitting with animals available uh, for you to purchase uh, perfect animals for sacrifice. People came from all over the known world into Jerusalem for Passover. And obviously, if you were coming from a great distance, you would not be necessarily able <clears throat> to bring a Passover lamb with you. So you counted on being able to purchase one after you arrived. Number one, you couldn't use your money. You had to use their money. So you have money changers. And the money changers change your money, whatever you brought in, into <clears throat> temple talents that could be used to buy uh, the, the, the lamps, or the, well, primarily the lamp. Well, uh, this is not, I mean, it sometimes can be true, but today, probably not so much as then, but um, it's very hard to keep track of how much money is worth when you cross from one country to another, even as close as it is to Canada. For example, when you go to Canada, if you, if they, if you buy Canadian, if you trade your money for Canadian money, it depends on that day what that money is actually worth in Canadian dollars. And of course, that's true worldwide when you go from country to country. Now, we have, <clears throat> in today, we have ways of knowing what money's worth. Uh, you can Google it, you can uh, get an app that will, you can put in your money versus their money, you know how much exactly you're supposed to get back, more or less, depending on the worth of the money. However, the apps back in those days were pretty few and far between, and therefore they had they don't have a clue. So they give the people at the temple money and get money back. Well, um, that's obviously something that can be <coughs> corrupted quickly, uh, and that you wouldn't get a fair value there and wouldn't know the difference. You just have to accept and trust them that they're going to do what's right. And apparently at this time, they weren't. 
for the most part. Now, when you go to buy your land, because your land was never good enough, you know, you bring a land with you and you say, here's my land, and they go, I'm sorry, that one's not good enough. However, we got some over here. It's kind of like a used car salesman. You know, your, your car's not worth much, but we got some better cars over here and we'll trade. And of course, you'll pay the difference. Well, it is, it is reported that some of the lambs that weren't good enough for sacrifice were put in the pen and sold as lambs that were good enough when somebody else came up. So it was a constant swapping and a constant, the, the people inside the temple, the Jewish leaders were making money hand over fist every time uh, Passover rolled around because of all the money changing advantage and then the used land business that they were in that they could resell and resell and resell and there was no argument you know there was no way you could argue with them because they 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 had all the cards if they wouldn't accept your lamb you didn't have a sacrifice and that's the whole purpose of being there so you know you didn't you didn't have the possibility of going and saying well my lamb looks as good as the lamb you're fixing to sell me. No, you had to take what they told you because these were approved animals. And of course, as soon as they got your animal, unless it literally had a broken leg or something, uh, they immediately approved it as sacrificially available. And then they would trade it to the next person who came on. So it was a racket. And this was the reason that... Uh, <clears throat> that we have had this come up and the reason that Jesus became so uh, angry because it was a, a, a sham and it was a way of taking advantage of people and Jesus was not in favor of such a thing happening. Um, so we see him getting the whips together on the uh, cords together and making a whip and uh, clearing out the temple of the whole thing. This is not anger as we probably think of it. Uh, there, there is anger, which is a, a flaring of the emotions where you just it just hits you and it makes you so mad. You you throw things, you do things, you, you know, whatever. And then there is a considered anger. The considered <coughs> anger is what I see in front of me is not right. It makes me angry that it's going on. And I will make, I will determine to make effort to correct the problem. And I will suggest to you that this is the kind of anger Jesus had. Uh, he wasn't blurry-eyed, just throwing things around, have something to do. But it was a it was a well thought through anger that he had, and the the way to deal with it was to do what he did. Okay, in other words, he did not do anything wrong. It's not wrong to be angry. <clears throat> you can be angry and not sin. So anger itself is not a sin. But it's what you, how you handle the anger that makes it correct. Uh, I might not have used the same technique that Jesus did, but I know what he, what he, the technique he used was correct because God did not hold him accountable for sin so therefore, his approach was correct. And that's where I think, you know, people who get in trouble with their anger is when it's uh, reactionary, just completely reactionary. Did Jesus completely just react? No, I believe Jesus knew this was coming <clears throat> because it's prophesied. It's not, it's not uh, uh, the psalmist talks about it this event taking place. So I think that Jesus 
knew when he got there what he was going to see and already had planned what he was going to do and possibly had even discussed it with the father before he got there. I'm not saying he did or didn't because I don't know that, but uh, it wasn't just he sees it and reacts to it. And that's where, uh, as we are followers of Christ, we've got to be careful. It's not wrong to be angry. There's a lot to be angry at in this world. Uh, mistreatment of people, uh, sin, Satan, and everything that goes on with it, okay? So it's not like, oh, uh, if you get angry, you're, you're sinning. No, you're not sinning. But what, how, what are you angry over? In other words, is it something that God is not in favor of, therefore I'm angry that it's going on? That's being angry over sin. And we should be angry over sin. You know, we shouldn't just be so uh, uh, commonplace with us that we look at it and go, oh, no big deal. You know, who cares? No. But what do you do then with that anger? How do you express it? What do you do with it? What are options that are open to you? There's options open to us today as we react to some sin, not, not everything, but as we react to it, uh, the correct reaction as opposed to incorrect. Um, just being angry and not doing, and attempting to do something about whatever it is making you angry, it's probably not all that profitable. All you do is raise your blood pressure and, and makes you upset. And yet, if you don't do something with that anger, and or if you don't release it in some productive way, um, you're going to be angry again the next time it comes out because it's going to have you're going to see the same thing again and again and again. And then there's other things that come along that I'm I'm angry about that I have to acknowledge. I have no control over this. There's nothing I can do about it. I cannot change it. I can't fix it. All I can do is the one thing God tells me to do, and that is pray and turn it over to God and say, God, I'm angry about this. And I know you're angry about this because I feel it having read your word that I should be angry about this. But because I can't do anything about it, Father, I'll let you, I'll turn it over to you. Hard to do. Hard to do because we want to fix it. The natural uh, reaction is we want to make a, 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 a whip out of cords and go beat the fire out of somebody, something, or a, or a situation. That doesn't always work. Jesus, no doubt. I mean, it doesn't take much thought to realize that Jesus was angry many times because he saw sin on every front and it no doubt made him angry. This is the time that he reacts and we see his reaction. But no doubt he was angry when he saw the mistreatment of, of widows and uh, he calls these, he calls the Pharisees white and sepulchers. And I mean, verbally, he gets angry. You can hear the anger in his voice over these things, but there's, but he didn't take physical action with each time he was angry. And part of that is just simply coming to the realization that there's things I have control over and there's things that I do not. Christ being God's son, we can say, well, he had control over the whole thing, everything. But that's not true because he's only going to do what the father wants him to do. So there's things that were down here that he didn't fix. He had to leave it alone, even though it was wrong and he knew it was wrong. So it's kind of, kind of important that we... Uh, realize that even Jesus worked with and had to deal with limitations to his own anger and his own feeling of uh, wanting to fix things and wanting to uh, 
make it right. And there's just some things in this life that we have to accept the fact that it's beyond my, it's a, it is beyond my ability to fix. Doesn't mean I'm not well, wanting to fix it. And it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be at some point fixed, but it may not be my job. I may have to leave that for someone else to do and or it may just never be fixed the way I think. Part of the problem being that I'm not wise enough to know how to fix it. And I think I know. I think I know that if, if, if I was God, you know, I would do X, we'd fix this problem, whatever the problem may be. But I don't know all the circumstances. I don't, I can't see the result of the action that I would take as to whether it would meet the goal I have in mind. I can be well, I, everything I'm thinking and wanting to do is very well intended. But that doesn't mean that it will be something that it's my job to do. In Psalm 69 and verse 9 is the actual statement that John makes re reference to. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. And of course, the psalmist is talking it's a messianic statement, and it refers to basically this particular event. Um, so, what are we going? What are we going to do about this situation? Well, the Jews have a problem, and beginning in verse eighteen and following. They, have, they, they don't like what Jesus just did. He really squirreled everything up for them. But they got a problem because they don't want to lose the money and the, and the, and the potential for profit here. But the people are on the side of Jesus. And they, they, they can't afford to have a revolt against them by the people who are backing this this teacher person that's come out of Nazareth that shouldn't know anything that seems to have a, a control as it were over the um, over over what was going on now uh, they want to sign. And Jesus says, well, there will be a sign, but you won't recognize it either uh, because you've already made up your mind not to accept what's coming. Again, the Jews wanted to, were expecting the Messiah, but what is their problem? They want a conquering hero soldier on a white horse to come riding in and not, not bring salvation. But on a physical level, they want the Romans gone and the Jews back in power. So, you know, if you're the son of God, if you're, if you're, if you're important enough to do what you're doing, where do you get your power from? Well, Jesus will tell them over and over. God, but they're not going to buy it. They're not going to believe it. They're, they refuse to accept that. So there's no, there are no, no recorded miracles in the area of Judea at this time. Why? What good would it do? The only purpose of a miracle as John will have it pronounced in his book over and over and over, is to prove who Jesus is. <clears throat> okay? 
if people have already decided that they're not going to believe him, no matter what he does, there's no point wasting time with miracles. It wouldn't do any good. Um, if you recall in the uh, parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man who's in torment says to Father Abraham, you know, if somebody goes back from the dead, and talk to my brother, brothers, they'll, they'll repent. And, and Abraham says, no. Even if somebody came back from the dead, they wouldn't listen to it. How do you know that? Because very shortly, Jesus, who's telling the parable, is going to be that person. He's going to come back from the dead. People are going to know he was dead. And, but they're still not going to believe a word he says and so he know he already knows that um the selling of animals by the way was, was a legal practice this, this that was not what was wrong because in the old law in exodus chapter 16 it talks about what they're doing the problem is what they're doing is a corruption of what God intended to be done. In other words, it wasn't wrong. Their, their actions were not in and of themselves wrong. What made it wrong was they began to use this system to create <clears throat> a profit for themselves <clears throat> and uh, began to make it a sham. Uh, because yeah, God did not want unclean animal, not unclean, but less than perfect animal. So he had arranged a way for them, for people to have a perfect animal to sacrifice. But they had taken it and corrupted the idea, which is not all that unusual. Um, uh, Jesus saw what was going on. It made him angry. Uh, it was a moral outrage. I mean, it wasn't just wasn't just something that, that caused him to be short-tempered. People who have uh, anger issues often say, "Well, I'm just I'm just that way," or you know, I have red hair, and that means I, you know you should expect that from me. And and the, God says, "No, I shouldn't." Now, does God want us to become angry over sin? Absolutely, but anger with the with the intent of correcting it, not just being angry, but doing something uh, to correct the problem in a correct way. Um, there, there's a lot. There are a lot of things that we see in our a religious world today, and I'm speaking in the, in the generic sense of religion, where you see people protesting and uh, all these kinds of things, and nowhere in scripture does it say that is the way to deal with it. Now, is it wrong to deal with it that way? No, not necessarily. There may be, there may be times that that's appropriate. But by and large, uh, even in our country today, the protesting of, even if you're on the right side of the issue, whatever the right side is, as opposed to the far left side, I suppose. But uh, if you're on the right side of the issue, is it right, to, is it bad, is it wise to protest? And I'm going to say, no, it's not. There, there, you may find examples and they'll sort of be different than what I'm referring to, but recently in our history, very recently, as in January of this year, there was a great protest that took place. You're talking about burning buildings down and stuff like that in anger, whereas you can speak out against something. Absolutely, you can speak out. Absolutely, you can in this country because of the freedom we got but when you go and you speak out as a group the problem you get into is what you're doing may be perfectly right 
I'm perfectly fine. But there can be people put into that group who choose to mess it up. And when they do, the whole group gets blank. And that's true of anything. And so sometimes you may have the right to do it. You may have the will to do it. And it may look like the thing to do, but ultimately it turns out maybe not. Maybe it was been better not to have done it, to have saved all the confusion and issues that followed. So all I'm saying is when we become angry, one of the problems with anger is that it generally shuts off logical thinking. It's hard to be angry and logical at the same time because, because anger is an emotional feeling. And we we act and we we react out of anger, out of out of emotion. Now, Jesus has the ability to have the emotion of anger, and the and the ability to be reasonable, logical, and biblical in his response. That's difficult, very very difficult. And therefore, when we get angry, sometimes we need to wait before we act and think through what we need to do. Now, not saying it's wrong to be angry, because Jesus got angry. And the Bible says, be angry and sin not. I mean, that's straight out of the Bible. And so it's obviously possible to do. Well, when Jesus took the whip, did he just pop it and go by and hit the people? Your guess is a good mind, he doesn't say. I get the picture that he was- Well, I have the, behind my picture, well, my picture, yeah. which is, has nothing to do with reality or what happened, but uh, my picture is... what I read, that's the way I... Well, read. my picture is that he used the whip on the animals, but not on the people. Now, that's just my opinion. Strictly my opinion. Uh, he turned the money changers' tables over, and he used the whip on the animals to drive them out of the temple area. That is... My opinion uh, does not mean that that's what, what happened because I wasn't there. Um, and as I say, the photographs are so blurred by now, it's hard, to, it's hard to know. And the videos are just not almost non existent. So uh, we just don't have, unfortunately, there weren't any, there were no people there on that day with cell phones because if we had cell phones, Believe me, we'd had all the video you really wanted to look at to see exactly what happened. But I don't, I, I don't know, but I don't believe that Jesus would have used the whip, the cord, the whip that he had in his hand on any of the people. I figured there was so much commotion and so much destruction going on, confusion. You know, nobody was, I mean, they were totally shocked when this happened, this had never happened before. I mean, nobody would even remotely consider doing something like this. Hey, you could be uh, potentially uh, executed for doing something like this in God's house, because that's how they saw it. And to have somebody come in and destroy, you know, uh, uh, turn over tables and, and using whips and running, having animals running around where they're not supposed to be and things like that. Um, I, I just, I, I, I visualize Jesus being angry, but I think he was pur purposeful in his anger and probably did not attack the people, but rather the animals and the objects that the people were working. But make clear note, I'll say it one more time. That is my opinion and is not reflected in scripture one way or the other all right so but when when the disciples saw this taking place they remembered the verse in psalms and which shows that these disciples although they were not educated men they were fishermen, tax collectors, all an uh, assortment of individuals, and certainly not. Uh, they were not scholars. But 
they definitely um, had a knowledge of scripture to the point that they connected it up and remember and saw that this was something that would be uh, feasible, possible, and it should could have been even expected if you knew what to look for and how to look for it. Now, did they get that by divine revelation? Did they figure it out on their own? I don't know. Uh, I, I have no way of knowing. It doesn't say, it just says they remembered that it had been spoken of it by the psalmist. All right, so uh, what? Verse 18. Uh, what what uh, sign? Let's look at that sign thing a bit more. Um, what does Jesus tell them is going to be the sign? Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Excuse me? We've been working on this for years. Herod hadn't even finished it yet. I mean, it's still under construction and it's been under construction for decades. And you're going to do what? You're going to tear it down and rebuild it in three days. Uh, it took all the way to the disciples to remember. Right. It took 45 years to build the temple. And you're going to do it in three days. Yeah, right. I mean, there's no way that they understood that. There's no way I would have understood that. Had I heard the same thing. Because I'm, you know, I'm not thinking on a spiritual level, I'm thinking on a physical level. I can't think on a spiritual level. I don't have the I don't have the knowledge to think that way. I mean, at this time, the Jews didn't know that. There's no record. There, there's all kinds of indication in the Old Testament and prophets of Jesus being brought back, you know, coming down and dying and and all that. You can you can find that sort of thing, but but to make the connection between what he's talking about. Because he's not talking about the literal, the literal temple. What is he talking about? The temple being his body, as it were. He's going to die, and three days later, he'll be resurrected. Well, needless to say, they didn't quite get that one. Um, but the temple he spoke of was his body, it says. After he was raised from the dead, the disciples were called what he had said, then they believe the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So who is he saying this for? The benefit of the Jews? No, because he only knows they're not going to figure it out. Uh, do the disciples understand it immediately? And they go, I got it. I know what's going to happen. You can see Peter kind of punching Andrew and saying, I got it figured out. No, you don't. He had they were just as confused as the Jews were confused. And they didn't believe what he said either. But when it happened, they remembered. Which is really kind of remarkable in itself. That at that time, they put it all, they began to put it all together. And again, I don't know how much. Uh, help they had from from direct revelation or not, but they said, but they did remember what he said, and they did put it together. And so, <clears throat> now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, as many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man. <laughs> Man's testimony about man, for he knew he was, he knew what he was in a man. In other words, I don't need confirmation from you. It'd be real easy for Jesus to have said, okay, I'm, I'm getting a following going now. And that would be the human response. Uh, I've got, I'm getting what I want. 
I'm becoming famous, I'm becoming popular, and people are beginning to believe me. This is pretty good, pretty good stuff. But he doesn't allow that to happen. Why doesn't he allow it to happen? Because it's not time yet. It's not time for people to believe in him as the son of God and obey because there's nothing now to obey. He's got to wait until after uh, the uh, death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, in in uh, Matthew, Peter, Peter and the disciples all agree that he's the son of God. Because in chapter 16, uh, Jesus said, I'll build my, upon this rock, I'll build my church. What was the rock? The, you are the son of God. Do you know, do you remember what he says right after that? No. He, he says, in effect, but don't tell anybody. What do you mean, don't tell him that? I thought that was the whole purpose. And he's going, no, because... They're going to want to make a king out of me. They're going to want to try to fulfill their vision of Messiah. And I haven't got time for that. And I don't want to deal with that controversy. I don't want to deal with it. So you don't tell anybody. Why didn't he want the, throughout the, throughout his ministry, he'll tell people he's, he's healed. Don't tell anybody. Because He's getting the wrong kind of crowd. He's not down here for popularity. He's not down here to build an army to go out and defeat the Romans. He's down here to fulfill God's plan. And God's plan doesn't have time for extra people coming around and uh, having him having to deal with other issues besides the issues he's here to deal with. Here, is a very good example of him not wanting their confirmation. Oh, they'll confirm that he, but they're not going to confirm all of what he wants confirmed because they're not going to realize who he, you know, you say you're the son of God. And even that means something to them, but it doesn't mean everything that he wants it to mean. And they'll learn more after his resurrection and the coming of the church in Acts chapter two. And then that's when he wants everybody to know who he was, what he was here for and what he did, but he's completed the mission. And we see the whole thing. We can, we can now through scripture, put it together. But at this point in time, there wasn't enough information available that they could possibly come up with the right answer. So he says, I'm not going to sit around here and, and enjoy the platitudes that come with man's appreciation for who I am, what I am, because they don't know. They think they know, but even the ones that, even the disciples didn't understand all that he wanted them to know at this time. So he shuts it all down. And But the important part is, Jesus knew who he was, and therefore he didn't need confirmation. As a follower of Christ, as a Christian, I don't need the world's confirmation of who I am. Number one, they wouldn't understand it anyway, so they're never going to give me that. Oh, I'll get confirmation on various things. You know, uh, I'm educated, I'm, I'm this, I'm a professional, I've accomplished these things. And this puts me in a position of authority in some area. You know, um, there's confirmation of that. But when it comes to being a Christian, I'm not waiting for that. I'm not waiting for the world to confirm that because they never will. They don't know how. They don't know what a Christian is. So I'm going to have to. I'm going to put my trust in God and say whether I get any recognition for being a follower of yours, doesn't really matter. If I do, praise God. If I don't, I'll be like Jeremiah and Noah and folks like that that never did get 
were on the claim for what they did or what they believed, but they still followed God. Okay, it's time for us to quit.